message today is the continuation of what I believe will be a two-part series on Gideon. And today it's Gideon part two, a few good men. We've heard that somewhere before. I've got a son who is a Marine and their slogan, of course, is we're looking for a few good men. And, uh, it, uh, and they are good men too. <laughs> but uh, that phrase takes on a new meaning when we look at this second section in the story of Gideon. We did chapter 6 in our last study. Please join me in your Bibles in the book of Judges, Judges chapter 7. And we're going to get off the starting line with a bang here. Just to give you a little background, the children of Israel are being oppressed by an enemy. For seven years now, a threefold union of um, enemy forces, the Amalekites, the Midianites, and the people of the east are harassing the children of Israel. They are swarming over the country whenever they harvest any of the produce. They basically rape the countryside. They leave no sustenance for the children of Israel or for their cattle. The people of God are greatly impoverished. They're hiding and trembling in the caves and the hills. And the Bible tells us they cried unto the Lord. God sends an angel who appears to Gideon under a terebinth tree and says, I have chosen you. Gideon begins by throwing down the altar of Baal. He builds an altar to God. And now word is beginning to spread to the Amalekites that uh, someone has been picked to be the deliverer for God's people and they muster their armies. And this is where our story begins. Chapter 7, verse 1. Then Jeroboam, that is Gideon, remember he was renamed Jeroboam because he contended with Baal. He threw over the altar of Baal. And all the people who were with him, he had blown the trumpet and all these people came to follow him. There's about 32,000 of them, mostly from the tribe of Manasseh. They rose early and they encamped beside the well of Herod. Now that word Herod means terror or shaking. And you can understand why. You read the rest of the verse, it says, So the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them by the hill of Moreh in the valley. And the Bible tells us that they were uh, an enormous army that probably reached a million or more. So here Gideon is getting ready to go against this massive threefold union of the Amalekites, Midianites, and people of the east that fill the land. It says they are like locusts, they're like the sand of the sea, they are without number. These are all phrases that are used. 32,000 men. And you can understand why it says they gathered by the well of trembling, terror, and shaking. Um, They wanted to be used of God to deliver their people. They heard the trumpet call them to battle, but they were terrified because they were so vastly outnumbered. Now, there's some very important things to consider here just in the first verse. First of all, the Bible tells us that the Lord now speaks to Gideon. Verse 2 says, the Lord said to Gideon, where does he say it to Gideon? By the hill of Moreh. Now you read in your Bible, back in Genesis chapter 12, God spoke to Abraham by the hill of Moreh. That word Moreh means instruction. God made a covenant with Abraham. The very first covenant that God made with Abraham, that I will give you this land, is where God now speaks to Gideon. God does things in certain places to jar their memories. Now it looked like the land belonged to the enemy. God takes that very place. He gave the covenant to Abraham. And here's what he said to Abraham. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to your descendants, will I give the land? And he built an altar there. The remnants of that altar may have still been there. And God was reminding Gideon, this is not their land, this is your land. And the reason that they have what they're not supposed to have is because you were serving the wrong gods. And so he's reminding him. The other thing is you'll notice that it says it happens by a terebinth tree once again. That's where the angel first appears to Gideon. And it says in verse 2, And the Lord said to Gideon, I want to pause there. And you're thinking, how will you never get through this chapter? I want to read this to you in Hebrew. Uh, One more thing. Wait, before we get too far, I want to emphasize something. The Lord meets with them by a well. Have you noticed how many times in the Bible the people are tested at the water? He meets with them at the well. It was at the water he tested 
the children of Israel at the Red Sea. He tested them again at the Jordan. Jesus, of course, revealed himself at a well to that woman, not far from this event with Gideon. And so God often tests us by the waters. Baptism is a place where we are tested at the waters. It's a test of commitment to God, of trusting in God, and recognizing that he is the living water that will supply our needs. But as you look at the first phrase in uh, Genesis, I'm sorry, in uh, Judges chapter 7 verse 2, I want to show it to you, I don't often do this, in the Hebrew. Here's what it says when it says God spoke to Gideon. You'll read it and it says, Yehovah or Jehovah Arma Gideon. Now does that last two words look familiar? When you get to Revelation chapter 16 verse 16, it tells about these three unclean spirits gathering the kings of the earth to this battle that is known as, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. This is one of the great mysteries of theology, what this word means, where is this place, what is Armageddon, what is the battle. There is no other place in, in Greek literature where we can find the word Armageddon. Typically, the popular version of Bible scholars is, there's a place called Megiddo, and there's a valley of Megiddo, and they figure it must mean Har Megiddo, which means the hill of Megiddo. That's not altogether off because Megiddo is associated with Gideon. You see, when you look in the first part of the story of Gideon in chapter 6, it says the Lord appeared to him in Afra. Megiddo and Afra are on top of each other. Megiddo is where Gideon came from. Armageddon is not really dealing with Megiddo. It's dealing with Gideon. Now the battle that Gideon is getting ready to fight is against a three-fold union, just like the beast in Revelation, the dragon and the false prophet. Three unclean spirits like frogs came out of the mouth of the beast. And he gathers his little bitty army that is vastly outnumbered and God fights for them. And we're going to find out how Gideon gains the victory. It's the same way God's people gain the victory in the last days. But I just want you to think, when you think Armageddon, don't think Hill of Megiddo, Valley of Jezreel. Uh, though there is a connection, think Gideon. Gideon is the key that unlocks that. And I'm not alone. A number of Bible scholars uh, embrace this. This is actually a more traditional interpretation of the word. And the Lord, the Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, Mine own hand has saved me. Now, not too many pastors would like to hear a message from the Lord that said, Doug, you have too many members at Central. Because, you know, we're always trained to try and get as many as we can. And when you're getting ready to go fight against an army of a million, and you've only got 32,000, when the Lord says you've got too many, you would, you would probably try and clean the wax out and say, I didn't hear that right. Too many now? You know why? As we read on, we're going to find out God is more concerned with the quality of the soldiers than the quantity. There is no restraint with the Lord whether to deliver with few or many. God can take on a whole army with just a Jonathan and his armor bearer or just a David or just a Samson. God doesn't care about the numbers. It's not the quantity, it's the quality. And I think probably one of the biggest mistakes that's being made in churches today is the pressure to look successful by adding people to the church who may not be converted. It weakens the church. It also gives a false sense of success where we will say, we have got the victory. Look how successful we are. Look how many people we have. Man looks on the outside, God looks on the heart. And he may find that we look like we've got quantity, but what he wants is quality. Now, how does he begin to sift down, to pare down the, the outward soldiers from the real soldiers? He begins to go through this process of elimination. And we look here in Judges chapter 7. And he said, Now therefore proclaim in the hearing of the people. He's going to eliminate the fearful. Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. Well, Gideon did that. And the Bible says that he lost more than two-thirds of his army. 
22,000 of the people returned and 10,000 remained. I think that uh, Gideon might have felt a little weak in the knees at this point, but he's, he's already seen an angel. He knows that God is leading him. He remembers the story in the past. He is basing his faith on what God has done before and he's trusting God is going to do it again. Also keep in mind there were some promises they had in the Word of God even back then. Moses had instructed the priests when they gathered the children of Israel together for battle. Deuteronomy 20 verse 1. A lot of verses I'm giving you today. When you go out to battle against your enemy and you see horses and chariots and a people more numerous than you. He said don't worry about how numerous they are. Do not be afraid of them. For the Lord your God is with you. The devil wants to intimidate us with the size of Goliath. God says, don't be afraid. If I'm with you, don't be afraid. You know, this is the lesson we really need to learn in the last days, friends, because we're going to be intimidated by the crowd. You know, you think about the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and one reason they were heroes is they did not look at the crowd, they looked at God. When the crowd bowed down, they said, we're not looking at the crowd, even though they're more numerous than we are. They decided to follow the Lord. Daniel didn't care about the crowd that watched him open his windows when it was against the law. He was not going to be controlled by the multitude. God needs people who will not be intimidated by numbers or by the crowd. And so he says, we don't want the fearful. Deuteronomy 20 verse 8, The officer shall further speak to the people, saying, What man is there among you who is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return to his house lest the heart of his brethren faint like his heart. Fear is contagious. Not only is it true in an army, it is true in a church. Now I think the Lord would have us be prudent, and I'll get to that in a minute. But so often when God's people prepare to step out in faith and do something great for God, you'll have a few fearful people who will intimidate the rest and say, look at all the problems we're going to have. It's impossible. We could never achieve this. This is reckless. What do you think we're doing? And they can create an epidemic of trembling in the camp. And uh, sometimes it's better for them to go home than to terrify everybody around them. God needs people who will know what God wants them to do, know where the battle is, and they're not afraid to go forward and to fight. You know, fear, the wrong kind of fear, is a sin. Now, we need to fear God. And you've heard me say before, if you fear God, you don't fear anything else. If you do not fear God, you will fear everything else. The question is where you direct your fear. If you revere God, nothing else will frighten you. Revelation 21, verse 8, But the fearful, it goes on to say, will have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The fearful are cast into the lake of fire. God wants us to be controlled not by fear, but by faith. Amen? Well, he's only got 10,000 men left. And the Lord now says to Gideon, uh, I don't know how to break this to you, Gideon, but the, the people who are with you, chapter 7 verse 4 and then he says Yahweh Armageddon that's the Hebrew again the Lord said to Gideon the people are still too many bring them down to the water and I will test them for you there then it will be that of whom I say to you this one will go with you the same will go with you and whomever I say to you this one will not go with you the same will not go with you God is now thinning the army down now, he's eliminated the fearful, but there's another group that's there that Gideon doesn't recognize, and they're the foolhardy. You've got the two extremes. They're the ones who are reckless, the foolish. They're not afraid of going into battle, but it's not because they're trusting in God. It's just because they don't know any better. Have you known people like that? And they say, oh, I'm not afraid of anything. And it's not because they're faithful. It's because they're not very bright. It's because they don't know how to, you know, I've got a friend who picked up a rattlesnake. He wasn't afraid. He got bit. A lot of nerve damage. No, he wasn't afraid, but it was foolish. And, you know, there are certain things that you don't want to do. And, and uh, if you go into battle, you don't want to be trusting in yourself. You need to be trusting in God. Otherwise, there's no virtue in being brave and reckless. Proverbs thirteen sixteen. Every prudent man acts with knowledge, but the fool lays open his folly. Proverbs 20, verse 3. Any fool can start a quarrel. Any fool can charge into battle, not knowing what he's doing. Proverbs 28, 26. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. 
But whoever walks wisely will be delivered. Doesn't mean don't go into battle. Even David, when he went into battle, he picked up some stones before he went against the giant, didn't he? You've got to make some provision. He went trusting in the Lord, but he also was prudent in that. So now the Lord has to eliminate those who are being reckless and foolhardy. I believe that we should pray for our loved ones that are sick, that God will miraculously heal them, and He can. But that doesn't mean you don't take them to the doctor. It doesn't mean you don't avail yourself of medical treatments and cures that are available. How many of you have heard stories of people who said, I've got faith, and I'm going to pray that the Lord will heal my child, my spouse or something, and they die because they don't avail themselves of some simple antibiotic the doctor could have given them because they thought it was faith. That's not faith. That's being foolhardy. So God wants us to use our heads. And that is also true in battle with the enemy. Now after this experience, something interesting happens. Keep in mind, they take him to the water and here's what the test is. As we're at the water, the Lord says, when they go to the water, those that, and I'm paraphrasing for you, those that squat down and drink the water as a dog lappeth with his tongue. You're to set them aside by themselves. And those that go down to the water and they just basically do a face plant in the water and suck the water up with their lips from the creek bed, you just set them aside. Now some people, when it says, as a dog lappeth, they said, isn't that the same thing? I mean, one person's got their face in the water, the other one's licking like a dog. That's not what it means. When a dog drinks, have you ever watched a dog when it drinks its water? They watch what's going on. They are naturally suspicious. And a dog is very alert. And when it drinks, it's vulnerable. And so a dog is going like this. The dog does not suck water like some animals do. It laps the water. What that means is it uses its tongue as a vehicle to bring the water up to its mouth. And so what Gideon is being told here by the Lord is those that bring their water to their mouth while looking around vigilantly like a dog. It doesn't mean licking with their tongues. It means using their hand the way a dog uses his tongue to bring the water up. That's what it means when you translate it. Looking around, vigilant, set those aside. They're brave, they're not afraid, but they're not being foolish. The Bible says the devil is going around as a roaring lion seeking whom he might devour. You need to be on your guard. Be sober, be vigilant. Christians need to be aware. And some will accuse you of being a little too scrupulous or careful when you try to avoid those things that lead to temptation. That's being vigilant. Other people are reckless and they get into trouble and they fall. You've got to watch where you step or you stumble. And so this is the vigilance he's talking about. So out of 10,000, only 300 think more about the battle than satisfying their own physical need. You see what's happening here? The ones who just say, oh, water, I'm thirsty. And they, don't for, they forget about the mission. And they just plant their face in the water and start sucking the water up. I don't know where I'd be in that group. I've thought about that before. I've come upon water when I'm th thirsty and just stuck my face right in and started drinking. And then I read the story of Gideon and I thought, where would I be? Of course, there was no war going on at the time. <laughs> but um, where would you be? Well, 9,700 were sent home. Now everyone thinks that Gideon is off his rocker and Gideon's beginning to wonder. So God says, I'm going to give you some additional encouragement because now he's got 300 men, but they're quality men. These are men who will obey, they will follow, they trust God, and yet they are, they can think for themselves. They're prudent. And God says, if you need some encouragement, turn back with me to Judges chapter 7. By the number of those who lap, putting their hand to their mouth, I'm in verse 6, there were 300 men. The rest of the people got down on their knees to drink the water. That means they put their faces in. Then the Lord said to Gideon, By the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let the other people, every man, go to his house. That means from the original number, only one in 106 people was chosen. So the people took provisions and their trumpets in their hands. Now these trumpets were all probably left behind from the original 32,000. You need a lot of trumpets to control an army that size. And he sent away the rest of the people, every man to his tent. And he retained those 300 men. Now the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. And it happened the same night that the Lord said to Gideon, 
Arise and go down against the camp. That means go down to the edges of the camp of the enemy. This is very reckless, but it's dark. They don't have searchlights back then like they do today. Go down to the edge of the camp. And it happened, he went down. He says, I will deliver it into your hand. But if you're afraid, if you still have any doubts or fear, go down to the camp with Pura, your servant. And that word Pura means beauty. It's like the word Linda in Latin or Spanish, Italian. It means beauty. Your servant. You know, that's one of the names of Christ. He serves like the Holy Spirit here because evidently this servant understands the language of the nomads, the Amalekites and the Midianites and the people of the East. He acts as translator, which is what the Holy Spirit does for us. So take your servant down. He'll translate what you're going to hear. And you'll hear what they say. Afterward, your hands will be strengthened. Something's going to be said that is going to strengthen you from what you hear. And I want you to listen to that. Now, he doesn't know what to listen for, but he tiptoes. Can you imagine? You know, the Midianites now have heard that Gideon's mustered an army. They know that. They're probably all making jokes about it because it's such a feeble army compared to their massive forces. Gideon creeps down the hills to the edge and the outskirts of the valley where the enemy is camped and they've got their bonfires scattered as far as the eye could see and soldiers are here and there. Now the Midianites, verse 12, and the Amalekites and all the people of the east were lying in the valley valley, as numerous as locusts and their camels were without number. The sand by the seashore in multitude. This is the most intense number given in the Bible to convey a big army. There's no other verse in the Bible that you can find that uses more terms to communicate a number, an innumerable, I'm not saying that right, innumerable army. You know, you read in the last days, it talks about Gog and Magog coming against the people of God at the end of the millennium. It says they're like a cloud. They cover the earth like the sand of the sea. It's, it's a, a, a parallel of this story here. And they're camels. They're tanks back then are without number, like the sand on the seashore. You know what's really sad is God had promised that if they were faithful, the descendants of Abraham would be like the sand of the seashore. Now the land of Israel is filled with people like the sand of the seashore who are enemies. Because of their unfaithfulness of God, the promised land was filled with enemies. If we are unfaithful as a church, you'd be surprised how quickly enemies can displace the believers. You've got to have a high standard. And when Gideon came to the outskirts of the camp, there was a man who was telling a dream to his companion. And he said, I've just had a dream. To my surprise, or suddenly that means, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian. And it came to a tent and it struck it so that the tent fell and it turned over and the tent collapsed. So here a prophetic dream is given through a pagan, for the benefit of God's people. Can you think of other times in the Bible when God gives a prophetic dream through the pagans for the benefit of God's people? How many remember when the Pharaoh had a dream that was really there for God's people? You can also read in the Bible where Nebuchadnezzar had two dreams that were given that ended up being evidence of the truth of God. See, one of the things that God does is all these pagan gods, you know, they can prognosticate and stuff, but they're just they're shooting into the clouds. They really don't know. When God reads the heart, a dream can only come from the heart. I can't make you dream anything. Well, that's not altogether true. I mean, you know, it might give you a nightmare. I mean, there are things that uh, people can do that uh, will so fill their mind you might dream about it. Who knows? But I can't control your dreams. Man can't control each other's dreams. God can speak to the heart. How many remember when a message came to Pilate, his wife had a dream. And that dream said, don't have anything to do with that just man. And so God often gives these dreams to the pagans for the encouragement and the evidence that God's people need. So here he's listening to this dream. I want to back up here and read that to you once again. A loaf of barley bread. This was the bread of the poor people. It was very simple bread. Matter of fact, barley could be used to not only feed the people, but to feed animals. During famine, they would eat barley. Ruth, the whole story of Ruth is during a famine. It's a famine in Bethlehem. If you think about that, a famine in Bethlehem, that's a famine in the house of bread. That's what the word Bethlehem means. 
but they're dealing with barley in the book of Ruth. This represents the simplicity of God's word. And it tells us that this one loaf of bread tumbles into the camp of Midian. It strikes a tent. A tent is when you stake a tent, you're pitching out your territory. And a tent means the children of the Amalekites, Midianites, and people of the east had taken the territory of God's people. That tent being knocked down by a roll of bread. It's called a circle of bread in the Hebrew. A little loaf of barley bread rolls down the hill, bounces on a tent, and knocks this whole tent down. Those tents were strong. They used to make their tents out of skin. They would stake them down to withstand desert storms. Those nomads knew how to pitch a tent. And for it to be knocked over by a loaf of bread, that's a powerful piece of bread. <laughs> what does bread represent? The Word and Christ. Jesus is the Word. Jesus is the bread. They're synonymous. Brings down the stronghold, the territory, the dominion of the enemy. It's just a little loaf of bread. I mean, the Lord does it even with a few crumbs. It's like that woman said, even the dogs get the crumbs. There's power, there's nourishment in the crumbs. Jesus said, don't let the scraps be wasted, right? Little bit of bread. One of my favorite verses in that great hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, is there's a phrase in there where Luther wrote, one little word will fell him. One little word. You take a promise of God, a verse destinies of nations have turned on faith in a verse of God a phrase of God the reformation a verse the just will live by faith one little word a little loaf of bread knocks down the tent and now his companion gives the interpretation verse 14 of this dream he said this is nothing else but the sword of Gideon the son of Joash a man in Israel for into his hand God has delivered Midian and the whole camp now, that really gave some encouragement to Gideon to hear that because nothing that he saw would make him think that his little army of 300 could take on over a million. And what was even more amazing is that the interpretation given by a Midianite to his friend would say the same thing because everyone else in their camp was laughing at Gideon. I mean, they could look and see their camels without number and their camp spread out like the sea. And for him to say... This dream means that Gideon is going to defeat our vast army. That was the reinforcement and the encouragement. That was the last encouragement that he needed. And it came about a dream relating to a loaf of bread and the power in a loaf of bread. Also, it said this is nothing but the sword. And we all know what a sword represents. The word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And so here he's got the encouragement from this. And so he now equips himself. So, where am I now? Oh yeah, go back to verse... Uh, when Gideon heard this, verse 15, the telling of the dream and its interpretation, instead of just strapping on his sword, he thanks God for the encouragement. He worships, then he returns to the camp. When Daniel got the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, before he told Nebuchadnezzar, you know what he did? He worshiped God. But sometimes when God answers our prayers and gives us encouragement, we forget to pause and to thank Him. So he worships God. He doesn't forget to give God the glory. He returns to the camp of Israel and he says, Arise, for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into our hand. See, God knew that he could not inspire his soldiers unless he was inspired. God inspires leaders that they might inspire others. And I often, in preparation for a message, say, Lord, inspire me. Because if this doesn't turn my crank, it won't turn anyone else's. And it's really hard to fabricate enthusiasm. And you've got to believe in it. It's got to be inside you. In order for me to pass off any flame to you, I first must ignite. And so this is what he's doing. The Lord ignited him with faith. And he went back up and he said, Arise, get up, we're going to go. And he, it was contagious. Same way fear is contagious, confidence and faith is contagious too. So God gave the faith to the leader through a barley loaf. Amen? Through the word of God, he gives faith and then he hopes that it will spread to those that are around. And it says, verse 16, he divided them into three, the 300 men into three companies. Now these three companies are going to get the victory over the enemy. They represent the three areas that must be guarded in our lives. All temptation can be divided into three general areas. You can read in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, you've heard me quote this. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. How many temptations came to Jesus? 
Three temptations dealing with the same three areas that cover every possible sin that you can, con you can even fabricate or imagine in your mind will fall into one of these three areas. There are three areas where even Adam fell in the garden. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. So he's got these armies stationed in three areas to help block the way of escape of the enemy. And so he organizes them, and you notice he divides them evenly because you never know which uh, area is going to be vulnerable. And then he tells them, he puts a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and torches inside the pitchers. And he says to them, look at me and do likewise. Watch, and when I come to the edge of the camp, you shall do as I do. Now who does Gideon represent in this story? He's a type of Christ. He's the leader of God's people. All the judges, when you study the judges of Israel, and he is one of the judges from the tribe of Manasseh, he's a type of Christ. And he says something very simple yet very profound. You watch me and you do what I do. Now, that makes me think of something that uh, Paul said. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1. Be ye followers of me even as I am of Christ. Now, I don't want anybody here following me except to the extent that you see me following Christ. Uh, you, you only want to follow those who are following Christ. And, you know, when you go into battle, it's important that there is unity. Uh, if everyone is sort of doing his own thing and there's no uh, unity among the troops, then you fail. What did Jesus say? All men will know you are my disciples by your love for one another. The devil knows that if he can smite the shepherd, the leader, the sheep scatter. That's what happened at the garden. And God, God, is, God is wanting his people to remember how important it is that we don't fight and squabble among ourselves. We're not the enemy. We need to work together. And we need to pray for our leaders and we need to follow them as they follow Christ. If you see a leader that's getting out of the way, don't follow that part. <laughs> follow them as they follow Christ. And do, he says, as I do. You know, Christ gave us an example that we should walk as he walked. He's a model for us. Now, it tells us that he also equipped every man. Does Jesus equip us? Everybody had something. And you know what they had? They had the same thing Gideon had. He didn't have anything they didn't have. Jesus, all the tools that were available to Jesus in fighting the devil are available to you. The Word of God. Christ did not overcome temptation. He did not live a victorious life using anything other than what is available to you. So he's not saying, look, I realize I'm going to have a machine gun, but I want you to blow your trumpet. No, he wasn't, he wasn't asking them to do anything other than what he was going to do. And so uh, let me get back to the battle here. As you see me do, so shall you do. When I blow the trumpet... And all who are with me, in other words, he went with one of the 300, then you blow the trumpet on every side the whole camp and say the sword of the Lord and Gideon. Now, he says, don't blow the trumpet unless I'm blowing the trumpet. Probably ought to talk a minute here about the trumpet. Uh, the trumpet represents warning. And you can see this in the Bible when you look in Isaiah 58, verse 1. Cry aloud. Spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Tell my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 8 and 9, For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, he's speaking about speaking in tongues, people babbling when others don't understand. Paul says, If the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for the battle? So likewise, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? Trumpets are to give a distinct sound. In Bible times, the trumpets were used to communicate with the armies. They did not have walkie-talkies as you see our Marines have today when they're in the field. They did not have a lot of the other methods of high-tech communication. They would communicate with a vast force like the cavalry used to do with a bugler. And he, I remember I went to military school and on the PA speaker every morning we'd hear... <laughs> Rebel, he hated it. It's even more annoying on a broken speaker. <laughs> and then at night, before we went to bed, we'd hear taps. You all know how that is. Right? 
There's signals that were, no, that goes all the way back to our army. Those, and then they had one for charge. I'm not trying to be funny. That's what, I mean, you know, how else are you going to make a bugle sound? And, and so these all had signals. And there was, there's a whole complex set of signals that they would have signals for right, for left, for retreat. And, but if the bugler's drunk and he's giving an uncertain sound, can you imagine the confusion in the army? They'd be, what is that? He's, play, he's playing jazz. I don't know. What does, what's an army to do? And so these signals had to be distinct. Now, Gideon says, when I blow the trumpet, you blow the trumpet. We've got some people that are blowing their trumpets somewhere and some way. Jesus is not blowing his trumpet. They're off trumpeting on their own. We should be emphasizing what the Lord emphasizes. There are certain things a trumpet represents the, the voice. Matter of fact, I'm not, don't know if I'm quite ready for this, but I don't know if you're ready for it either. Okay. I want to thank Cheryl Curtis. I was going to bring a trumpet, but you know, they didn't use, they didn't use regular um, brass trumpets all the time in battle. They were a nomadic people that had sheep and goats and things, and they used a lot of ram horns. I didn't have a ram horn, but I've got a conch shell. Now watch what happens. You know what a trumpet does? A trumpet symbolizes the Word of God. A trumpet takes a natural human sound, and it multiplies and magnifies it. Now you heard me a minute ago going... That's not that impressive, is it? Sounds like a baby elephant in distress, right? <laughs> but watch what happens when you apply that same effort of human voice to a trumpet. That's, I can't do reveille. That's all I can do is that one note. So what a trumpet is doing, it's magnifying the human voice. And it's a symbol for what the power of God will do with human instruments in sharing the truth. Just ignore this here for a second. I'm not quite ready for it, but I don't want to go back there again and get it. Okay. This is our children's story, so you all pay attention, okay? Where was I? Oh, yeah, he, broke, he put them in three companies. And he said, when I blow the trumpet, verse 18, you blow the trumpet. And all who are with me. Then you blow the trumpets on every side of the whole camp and say, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So Gideon and the 300 men who were with them, they came to the outposts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch. Just as they had posted the watch, and it says they blew their trumpets, they broke the pitchers that were in their hands. Now, this was very clever when you think about it because during the long night of waiting they always have people who stand watch. In the middle of the night is one of the best times to attack when the watch is changing guard. You know when the Japanese attacked the Pearl Harbor? The change of the morning watch. Why? Well, because whenever there's a change of watch, there's several dynamics taking place. First of all, there's overconfidence because you've got two people watching instead of one, but really neither are watching because they think the other's there. Second thing that happens is you've got someone who is exhausted because they're getting ready to go take their nap. They've been up, so they're not at their best. And the person who is just now replacing them has woken up and they may not have their scruples together. So it, it represents a time of vulnerability for watchmen. So God has reasons for all that he does. You notice that it's at the darkest hour, the middle of the night, when this battle is fought. Remember, Gideon represents Armageddon which at midnight, the darkest hour, is when our deliverance is going to come. Amen. During the darkest hour, they've all got lamps, but they're not shining the way they could shine. The Bible says in Isaiah 64, verse 8, But now, O Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay, you are our potter, we are the work of your hands. So what is, what is the pictures? We are, well, let me give you another scripture. I was hoping you'd get it with one. Let me give you another. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7. But we all have this treasure in earthen vessels. That's us. 
that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And so we are vessels of the Lord's filling. He wants us to let our light shine. I didn't have a pitcher that I could, I could break to illustrate this. Probably what they had is clay pitchers about this size. They were, not, they were not opaque where you could sort of see through them. I'm glad I've got this one because I want you to see inside. No, I'm not going to break it. <laughs> so some people wanted me to break it. That's not mine. I can't. The other thing is they were clay pitchers. It probably had, you'll see different paintings of this experience all convey it differently, but um, they probably had oil in the bottom with a floating wick. So it was burning. But when you have a lamp like that without air coming from below, the wick will burn, but it burns low. Clay, unlike glass, you could hit clay and it will break where you strike it. You can control the break. I mean, if they just smashed their pitchers to smithereens, how were they supposed to hold them up and say the, Lord, uh, the sword of the Lord? They would have just been crumbling in their hands. But clay, can, they could have taken their swords or even smashed their pitchers against each other and broken them in a more uniform way that would have allowed air to come in and the flame then burns bright. You got that? God burns the best and the brightest through broken pitchers. The Bible tells us that we are the vessels. He is the potter. We are the clay. And um, let me give you a few other scriptures on this point. Did the pitchers have oil inside? What is that a symbol of? The Holy Spirit. And then as that wind is exposed, it begins to burn. Vance Harvner said, God uses broken things. It takes broken soil to produce a crop broken clouds to give rain, broken grain to give bread, broken bread to give strength. It was the broken alabaster box that gives forth perfume. It's Peter weeping bitterly with a broken heart who returns with greater power than ever. Martin Luther said, God creates from nothing, so until we become nothing, he can make nothing of us. Now the third thing that we've got here is, what, what three things do they have on them? They've got the trumpet, they've got the pitchers, and they've got, it says, the sword of the Lord. They had swords. I mean, you can go into battle without a sword. What does that sword represent? Ephesians, there's a lot of scriptures you can use. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, it says, The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, oh, good, I'm glad I was able to do that. Woo, this thing's got an edge on it. This is not one of the demo models. The Bible tells us that the Word of God is like a two-edged sword. You know what the advantage of a two-edged sword is? You could go either way. The other reason it's got two edges, it represents the two parts, the duality of the Word of God, the law and the prophets, the two witnesses of the Word of God, Moses and Elijah. The Word of God is a two-edged sword. And so he, what is this a symbol of? The Word. What is the pitcher a symbol of? That's us. What is the trumpet a symbol of? That's the word being empowered. What is the bread? Does it make you nervous when pastors got one of these? <laughs> I've always wanted <laughs> Y'all listen to me. Who wants to get knighted? <laughs> Boy, I'm going to do this carefully here. You can shave with this thing. Okay. I'm going to get back to my... Get back to my... I need a new tailor after this. So, here they've got the pitchers. And he finally gives them the signal. And they break the pitchers... There's light in the pictures. When they first assume their positions, it's not burning. Nobody can see it. Remember, this is dark. But then what they do is they break the pictures and the light flares up. You've got 300 men all around. And keep in mind that back in Bible times, there was one trumpeter for hundreds. You get 300 trumpers, trumpets blowing. You get 300 men crashing pictures, probably made some noise. They're shouting, blowing. All of a sudden, the Midianites wake up and they look and in the hills, completely surrounding them on every side, they see lamps, they hear trumpets blowing, they hear men shouting. They woke up in an absolute terror. The confidence and the... It, it looked like an overwhelming uh, army. So I just want you all to have the picture 
of what's going on here. They've all got, they got their pitchers, they got their trumpets, so they're, hey, the sword of the Lord and Gideon, sword of the Lord, and they're making all this noise, big cacophony, okay? Kids are paying attention, I like this. <laughs> and so then they shout the sword of the Lord and the Gideon, and the Bible says after they do that, the enemy wakes up. Now, can you imagine being one of the 300? Um, I know when I went to school in New York City, every now and then I'd act like a hot shot when, you know, there were some people around like I wanted to fight. When it finally came time to fight, I'd run. <laughs> you know, a lot of show, you make a lot of noise, and you act like you're ready, and then when they finally, you know, start to take off their shirt, you say, Mom's calling you. Whew, you're out of there. <laughs> After blowing their trumpets and breaking their pitchers and shouting, they saw a million men wake up. How would you feel? You probably would have thought, well, I hope I scared them. You all ready to leave now? <laughs> but the Bible doesn't say that they left. The Bible says they stood their ground. That must have been as hard as anything else. It's one thing to wake a sleeping giant and run. It's another thing to wake a sleeping giant and chase him. You know, I'm still inspired by the the words of uh, the Bible when it says, David ran to meet the giant. Here it tells us that they stood their ground. God needs people to take a stand. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6, when it talks about the armor of God, three times it says, stand, stand, stand. Listen. Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you might be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand, therefore. You know where we get the word standards? It means that we believe something we're going to take a stand on and we're going to draw the line and say, I'm not moving. This is a truth that I believe in. I'm going to hold my ground. They were not going to move. They were going to make the enemy move. You know, the Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And finally, after the enemy woke up, Gideon, they continued blowing and marching down the mountainside. And I believe that they panicked and they began to run for their lives and they'd blow the trumpets a little louder. And they'd move a little faster. And the enemy began to panic and it says they all turned on each other. Let me read this to you here. We're back in Judges. You got your Bibles? Chapter 7. I want you to see how the enemy responded. And every man stood in his place all around the camp. And the whole army ran and cried and fled to resist the devil. He'll flee. When the 300 blowing the trumpets saw that... They set every man's sword against his companion throughout the whole camp. They began to run and to self-destruct. Keep in mind, they didn't all have the same uniform on. There's Amalekites, there's Midianites, there's people of the east. They began to turn on each other. When you read in Revelation, you know what finally happens to those that at one time were under the authority of that scarlet harlot, that woman in Revelation 17? It says they turn on her. And you read about what happens at the end, and the Bible tells us that they turn on each other. And they self-destruct. This is why I think there's a strong parallel between the story of Gideon and what's going to happen in the last days. And it says, They stood in their place, and every man's sword was against his companion throughout the whole camp. And the army fled to Beth Acacia towards Zerah as far as the border of Abel, Mahola, and Tabitha. And the men of Israel gathered together from Naphtali to Asher and all Manasseh and they pursued the Midianites. Now the ones who had gone home scared realize that the enemy is being routed and they now want to be part of the victory. And so all of a sudden all these other tribes begin to join the battle. The inspiration of these 300 that were faithful and finally inspires the men of Israel with a little more confidence and they begin to pursue them. And there's just one more verse I want to share with you before I, I quit here. When you get to chapter 8, they chased them and they chased them and they cut them down and they chased them. And the Bible says that they were running out of bread and none of the other neighbors would give them bread because they thought, how could you possibly gain a permanent victory over such a big force? What they needed to keep fighting was bread. Well, the Bible tells us they wouldn't give up. Verse 4, when Gideon came to the Jordan, he and the 300 men who were with him crossed over. They're leading all these other tribes that are following after. And I love this verse. Exhausted, but still in pursuit. Faint, but still pursuing. Isn't that wonderful? You know, sometimes in the Christian life, you're tired, you're hungry, 
you're weak, but you can't quit fighting. Because as soon as you stop fighting, the enemy is going to move back in again. Faint, but still pursuing. And we need that kind of determination to take a stand for the Lord and say, it's the truth. And even though others might be falling by the way and getting tired and giving up, even though it looks like, hey, you know what, we've chased them far enough. The Bible says it wasn't enough to chase them to the borders of the Jordan. They chased them completely out of their territory. They wouldn't quit at the Jordan. Sometimes we quit too soon when it comes to following the Lord. You say, well, I'm so much better than I used to be. I think I'll just park right here and I'm better than most people in the world. And as long as I can make that comparison and compare myself among myself and by myself, no, even if you're faint, keep pursuing until you've completely chased the enemy out of God's territory. You want to be free. Amen? You know, this is a wonderful story. Christ is our commander. The Bible says that we are soldiers. Amen? And it tells us that Christ goes before us. 2 Timothy 3 2 Timothy 2, rather, verse 3. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he might please him who enlisted him as a soldier. 1 Timothy 1.18. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, that you may wage a good warfare. And finally, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh... We do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare, we're not really using swords and trumpets and pitchers and pots, are we? We're not throwing barley loaves at tents. It's all symbols of spiritual weapons. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not physical, but they are mighty. In God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against God, the knowledge of God bringing every thought into the captivity and obedience to Christ. We need the bread of God's word to fight the enemy. This is the sword of God's word to fight the enemy. We need the Holy Spirit in our broken vessels. That means we fall at the foot of the cross, broken hearted, and then the Lord can make our light shine. Some of us have got our lights hidden under a bush. The reason our lights aren't shining, our vessel's never been broken. When the vessel's broken, the light will shine. And then we've got to have the courage to not only carry a trumpet, but we need to know when to blow the trumpet. That means to ask the Lord to amplify the message. Don't be ashamed. We need to lift up our voice like a trumpet and give it a certain sound and let people know that Jesus is coming. And then take a stand. Take a stand. There's so many stories here in Gideon that give us the keys to victory that God wants you to have. Would you like to have that victory, friends? He has given us his armor, his weapons, that we can have victory. Christ is our commander. As we trust in him, he is the commander of the Lord's army. The way he appeared to Joshua there at that vision. He appears in Revelation riding on a horse with a sword. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. That's not just something future tense. Jesus is our Gideon now. Amen? He is our commander now and he says, you do what I do. Follow me and he will lead us to victory. If you believe that, reach for your hymnal. We're going to sing our closing hymn, 608 which is faith is the victory. And let's stand and let's really sing.
I was reading this morning, just in my morning devotion, it happened to be on Gideon. What are the chances of that? I then looked in the back of the book. It was the only time in all of the, the whole devotional book that it addressed this story this morning. And it was talking about the one phrase that they were to shout, the sword of the Lord and Gideon. You know, that's telling us that we overcome trusting in the word of God and in the name of his Redeemer. That's how we do it. We trust in the Word of God and through the name of Christ, friends. Would you like to ask Him to give you that victory in Jesus' name? Father in heaven, Lord, we're thrilled as we consider this story that not only encourages us just as its history, but we see its prophetic significance. These things are going to be acted out again. In that valley, the battle of Armageddon will be fought once again where your people, though outnumbered, will gain the victory being filled with your spirit, their lights burning with love, with the sword of the word, and letting the trumpet shout. Lord, I just pray that we can be these people that will have the combination of faith and prudence, not being fearful or foolhardy. Bless us that we can be people through which you operate. Help us have victory in our lives. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.